Live Fit Podcast, episode 107, with Sapiwe Balika and 4-Minute Fit. Welcome to the Live Fit Podcast with Glenn Johnson, your resource for all things that contribute to good health. You will hear expert advice and interviews with leading authorities on fitness, food, fat loss, mindset, and the mind-body connection. You will find show notes, articles, and health programs at livefitpodcast.com. Ah, uh, yes, it is time once again for the Live Fit Podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Johnson, your guide to better health. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, subscribe, and most importantly, share this episode with somebody you care about. Because today I'm speaking with Sapiwe Balika, a truck driver turned fitness professional. When Sapiwe started truck driving, he witnessed his fitness decline and his body fat increase in a very short period of time. Then he figured out how he could increase his metabolism and burn fat in as little as four minutes a day without changing his eating habits. Sapiwe is the founder of Fitness Trucking and serves as the health and fitness coach at Prime Trucking. He is featured in the Emmy Award winning documentary called Changing Lanes, the Sapiwe Balika story by Fox Sports. Let's listen as Sapiwe tells us how he created 4-Minute Fit the metabolism accelerator for the time crunched, desk bound, and stressed out. And by the way, you don't have to be a trucker to use these concepts. Good morning, Sapiwe. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Glenn. How are you doing? I, I'm hanging in there, and it's it's a great day so far. I've already been for my walk and had my uh, push-ups, and I'm waking up. So. First of all, Sapiwe, um, tell me where your name comes from. It's a very interesting name I've never seen before. I'm sure you hear that a lot, but where does it come from? Well, the name Sapiwe, um, is, it means gift of the creator. And it's a name that's used by the Zulu and Hosa tribes in South Africa. Uh, it was not the name I was given at birth, um, but I had I went to South Africa and had a very profound experience and there was a council of elders in South Africa, and they said, whenever a son of the soil returns home, he gets a new name. Um, so they gave me the name Sipiwe. And my understanding is that if you go away on a journey, if you go somewhere far away or that you've never been to before, or you spend a fair amount of time away from home, that experience ought to change you. You ought to learn new things. You, you ought to have a different perspective on the life, on life. So when you return, you, you're a new person. You should get a new name. Um, and so, so that's how I got the name. And um, they, the last name is Baleka. Uh, that means he who returned. Well, actually, it means he who escaped. <laughs> uh, but it also, it also means fast. Uh, so I just... Uh, for for someone that had a name that didn't fit for most of my life, I mean, I'm I'm black, I'm African American, um, you know, I had a, a Italian Spanish first name and a Hebrew middle name and an English last name, and when I looked in the <laughs> mirror, Glenn, it's like it just didn't fit. I mean, imagine you woke up and every day, you, you know, your name was. Chin Lao Gomez, right? <laughs> you're, you're neither Chinese. Um, I don't know. Maybe you're not uh, Mexican and uh, uh, or Cambodian or whatever. So I just had a name that didn't fit. So when the elders gave me this name, it really meant a lot to me. Um, and to honor my ancestors, when I came back to the U.S., I had it legally changed, um, and now it 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 fits. Wow, that is an awesome story. I love it. I love it. I uh, wish we had a a little. Uh, tradition like that in in this country yeah i have a very uh anglo-saxon name i'm you know my ancestors are from the northern U european uh mm -hmm. regions all those countries in that whole big mush so i'm a you know i'm a, a mutt for sure so the reason i wanted you on the show is because you recently published a book called four minute fit and before we go into the details of the book because I'm, I'm sure who wouldn't want to exercise for four minutes a day. I think that's awesome. But first, give us some of your background. How did you get to the point where you wanted to share this information? Uh, and what's your what, what's your background on that? What's your, your exercise history, et cetera? Well, the way it started out was um, I got in 2008, I got into long haul truck driving after having been um, 
well, for 15 years, I hadn't done anything. But during college, I, I was a world class swimmer back in college. Wow. Um, and after college, I traveled around the world and did a bunch of things for 15 years and didn't do anything athletic, didn't do any training, no sports, nothing like that. Um, and then I got into truck driving and uh, I was 140 pounds, Glenn, the day I went to Prime Inc., which is a trucking company based in Springfield, Missouri. Uh -huh. I was 140 pounds when I started my truck driving career. And two months later, I had gained 10.7% of my body weight. Whoa. Uh, yeah. So I was now 155 pounds. I, I gained 15 pounds in two months. Uh, and I realized that at that moment that if I didn't take responsibility for my for my health and my fitness while I was on the road, that I was going to end up like the 86 percent of America's truck drivers that are overweight and the 69 percent that are obese. So that was the beginning of me trying to answer the question, what's the most effective, least time consuming way for me to get results, to burn fat? Um, stay fit, stay lean while I was out on the road. And ultimately, you know, I tried everything, every kind of fitness product, every kind of um, fitness program, every kind of nutrition program. And I realized that there's a nutrition and fitness program for everyone in America, except one that was specifically designed for long haul truck drivers and their unique environment. Right. So, I saw that there was a real need and there was a real business opportunity. So I decided I was going to design such a system. Uh, I spent three years as a lease operator at Prime Inc. Driving, you know, 330 days out of the year full time. Wow. And I created this system based on what worked and what didn't work. And then when my lease was up, I, I went and talked to Robert, who's the, the, the founder and owner of Prime. And I'm like, look, I've developed this system that I can take any driver. It doesn't matter who they are male or female, you know, young, old, new driver, veteran driver, I can remotely coach them using a lot of digital health devices. I can help them lose weight, but more importantly, I can measure and monitor their metabolism and I can make it 8% more efficient and effective. And that caught his attention. I mean, 8% is a lot, okay? Who yeah, wouldn't want to get an 8% 8, 8 raise, right? Yeah. Um, so I demoed the system for him and he said, this is what we need. And, uh, so he created this position for me at prime called driver health and fitness coach. Wow. Um, yeah, prime has about 7,000 drivers and I started implementing my system with prime right off the bat. Drivers started losing a lot, a lot of weight. Average weight loss was like 19 pounds in 13 weeks or 7% of their body weight. Mm-hmm. But we had drivers that were following my system the way it was designed, and they were losing 30, 40, 50, 60 pounds in 13 weeks without skipping meals. And all of a sudden, I had the number one weight loss program in the country that started getting a lot of media attention, and it was right here at a trucking company. It's like, you know, who would have, who would have thought that? Uh, and so after having done that for four years and compiled a lot of data, a lot of research on what works, what doesn't work for sedentary people, people that are stressed, you know, it doesn't matter if you're sitting behind a wheel or you're sitting behind a desk. And we took all of that information, all of the best practices, everything that w worked, and we put it into the book Four Minute Fit. And that's how that's how that came to be. Wow, that's that's pretty awesome. I'm I'm really impressed with the uh, you know, the technique that you came up with, and I and I really want to hear what that is. But uh, I just want to share something. A, a few years ago, I was kind of looking around for a niche that was un that was really untapped or upper upper underrepresented for uh, basically my business for improving someone's health and fitness. And I did think of trucking. I was looking into it for a while, but I, I just I really didn't have an end, didn't have any contacts, and I, I would have felt like a, a poser or a phony had I really <laughs> dived into it. But since you were actually a trucker, I think you were perfect for it. You were really poised to do something like that since you had that in and you, you had the, the rapport and the network. So I'm, I'm thrilled, thrilled, thrilled that somebody went and tackled that because I definitely see the need, and you know a lot of people – work in offices and they sit, but they can stand and they can get up and walk around and stretch every, you know, 20, 30 minutes if they, if they want to. But truckers, no, you can't really do that, can you? <laughs> no, you, it's a unique environment, Glenn. Um, you're living in a box. 
you don't have access to a kitchen. You have food storage issues because you're not carrying a refrigerator, you know, a normal sized refrigerator or a freezer mm-hmm. where you can store food for a week or a month. Right. Um, you're not getting to the local organic farmers market or the specialty stores that are selling the grass fed, hormone free meat, even even if you could afford to buy it. Um, and meanwhile, they're driving a tractor and a 53 foot trailer. So. You know, truckers, we don't like to go off what's called the trucker's grid, which is basically the main interstates and highways. Oh, yeah. Because the moment you do, there's the potential for all kinds of unforeseen delays and problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, So getting to the gym, not practical. Mm -hmm. And those gyms are not set up for truck parking anyway. No. So truck drivers have all of these restrictions, very severe restrictions. And I always say – you know, they might as well be an astronaut. That's how unique the environment is. Wow, that's pretty unique. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying because you really are kind of stuck in your environment and very, very limited. You know, it's like driving a ship. There's only so many um, ports you can park in, and you you can't turn very sharp, can you? I'm, I've always been very impressed whenever I'm in the city and I see a, a full size big rig making some of these corners with uh, you know cars coming on all directions and a telephone pole right on the corner and <laughs> just yeah. covering covering my eyes going oh my god how's he going to do this and and they always do and I'm like, that is just amazing well the athlete in me would look at that as a, like a challenge like okay i've got to make this three point shot to tie the game or you know i've got to swim a personal best so the harder the docking maneuver the more i was like okay watch this man i'm going to nail this um, <laughs> so for me it became a, a an ego competition like Okay, I know all these drivers are watching me. Um, I'm going to do this without having to pull forward or get out of my truck. Watch. <laughs> That's awesome. So when I was a kid, I used to watch a show called BJ and the Bear. Ever ever seen it? Yes. Uh, and, and I, of course, wanted to be a trucker because of that. And, you know, it turned out I, you know, once I got older and realized how much sitting there was, I changed my mind. But was that an influence on you? No, not really. I mean, as a, as a kid, I wanted to be a professional athlete and – uh, a famous lawyer. Um, and I never thought about being a truck driver. I got into trucking kind of by default. Um, after again, after I left, after I left college, um, I was traveling around the world. I was doing a lot of nonprofit work, and I didn't have your normal, typical um, work history uh-huh. <laughs> for, for 15 years. And by the time I realized, man, I had all these amazing experiences around the world, but the one thing I haven't done is make any money. And I realized I needed a career change and I just didn't see any opportunity and I didn't think that, you know, I just had a non-traditional resume that I didn't think would work. But I had a friend who was a truck driver and he's like, no, you should drive a truck, man. It, it, it suits your nomadic lifestyle and you've got plenty of time to think about what you want to do. And, and, and it seemed to be a good fit at the time. So um, that's how I got into truck driving and I loved it. It was great. It's it's you do feel free and you're seeing America um, and because I'm living in my truck and I'm not paying rent or a car note or anything like that. I'm, I'm able to save a lot of money. So it's a great profession, especially if you're young and single. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes people don't always, they're not always aware of that. Well, then how do you meet girls? You know, Glenn, that to be quite honest with you, that is a big white elephant in the room that nobody talks about. And it's <laughs> I'm going to be – look, I'm going to go out on a limb. This is going to make your interview distinguished from all the others because you brought it up. Yeah. But there is a connection between a healthy sex life and health and being fit. Sure. Um, And the more fit you are, the more fit your body is, the more comfortable you are with your body – You know, the more sexy you feel, that the more you have that vibe. So there's an issue as as a guy living in your truck. um, You you know, I would be out on the road for three months, four months at a time, and your only interaction with people for the most part is at truck stops. And there's not a lot of you know, it's a male dominated industry. There's not a lot of females, but where you do see women is at the truck stops. They're either behind the counters. You know, as the register woman, mm-hmm. or they're in the restaurants as your waitress or your hostess, um, or sometimes they'll be, you know, the secretaries at the shippers and receivers. 
And that's about it because you're not going out. You're not socializing. Most of the time when you finish a load, you're you're sitting in your truck, resting, relaxing. Um, so you have to use, you know, and this is common now. Everybody uses the Internet to meet people. Yeah. That's that's how you do it. Yeah. But it's an interesting issue because even if you're meeting someone and you're talking, you still haven't solved the problem of, okay, well, how do you have sex on the road? Right. And it's a real issue. You uh, you just have, uh, you know, somebody in, in each city that you visit, right? <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, some drivers – that is – some drivers do that. Some drivers, they may have a girlfriend or a wife that will ride on the truck occasionally or they're going home um, you know, every six or seven weeks. But if you're single, you don't have the girlfriend or a wife, it's a real dilemma. Yeah, yeah, I'll bet. So I, I, I see a niche there for somebody else. <laughs> is, there uh, a, is there a trucker dating website? Yeah, I'm sure there. I, I don't know. I'm sure there is, and there's plenty of dating websites. Yeah, uh, and I do talk about this in the book a little bit, just the connection between health and fitness and feeling good and having a healthy sex life and how they they feed each other. The healthier your sex life, the more energy and excited you are, mm -hmm. the more you feel like doing things, the more active you are, and then the more active you are and the more you work out, the better you feel about yourself, your body, your condition the more you know you feel sexy and you want to you know it's it's that whole snowball of, yeah it's that whole snowball effect that starts with you and if you feel like a dirty filthy lazy slob and you don't have the energy to walk up a flight of stairs you really aren't going to put yourself out there for somebody else to perhaps see that and point it out to you yes it's true so starting with yourself Taking care of yourself first, feeling good, doing all the self care that you need to do, and exercising, eating right, you know, maybe some, you know, relaxing and stretching appropriately. Those types of things can all benefit how you feel about yourself and how you project yourself out there. Well, curiously, I find that when I'm in a healthy relationship and I'm having great sex, I train better. Ah. As an athlete, and, and, and I perform better. And I actually swim faster and I set records. So that's to me, that's a component of performance. You have, you know, you have your nutrition, you have your training, you have your sleep, you have your rest and recovery. Mm -hmm. But sexual, se and it's funny we're getting into this. Who would have thought, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but sexual energy is some of the most powerful energy that we can experience as humans. And I believe that you can harness it. Um, this has nothing to do with the book, but it's an interesting conversation. But it does have something to do with the book, because what does the book do for you? It, it makes it makes you more fit, healthy, strong, yes. vital, and feel better about yourself. It improves your self-esteem and your self-concept, which parlays out to how you project yourself to the rest of the world. And then when you're getting positive feedback from you know the the gender you're 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 with, or even even your same and you know just your peers that builds you up even more so it's it's a reflection yes. too absolutely well, i love it so speaking of the book how's this thing work what do you mean four minutes i thought you're supposed to to be on the elliptical for an hour every single day what's yeah, what's you, going on here you and, and 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 half the rest of the world um that was that was a sarcasm right you, you got yeah that? okay <laughs> <laughs> so i mean when i when I was out on the road, I was trying to hack my metabolism, okay? Um, one of the real issues with truck drivers is they're out there to make money, which means they drive when the freight dictates, which means sometimes they're driving in the day, sometimes they're driving at night, sometimes they're not driving at all. Um, this makes their schedule changing all the time. And the problem with that is it throws off their circadian rhythms, okay? Um, right. And a lot of the, you know, a lot of the hormones that uh, – a lot of hormones are produced in your sleep, and it throws off hormone production, including hormones like serum leptin, serum ghrelin. The hormones regulate metabolism. When you take the, the, the changing schedule and the disruption to their circadian rhythms, in addition to the fact that most truck drivers are not getting six hours of uninterrupted sleep, they accumulate sleep deprivation, accumulates every day, every week, every month, every year they drive. And these two things together um, have a tremendous disruption to their hormones, and they literally, the drivers literally lose the ability to regulate metabolism properly. So 
using all the digital health equipment that was available to me at the time, and there was one particular piece of equipment that I used. They don't make anymore, but it was the only digital health device um, available where you could measure metabolism directly. And, and what I was, is that? What is that device? It was, it was called the Body Media Fit Armband. Okay. Um, they don't make it anymore. Um, but it had five sensors on it, captured like 5,000 data points every minute, mm -hmm. spun it around proprietary algorithm, and then used – put it on this scale and use this uh, unit of measure called MET, M-E-T-S, stands mm -hmm. for metabolic equivalence. Um, and it had a scale. Zero to three was light or sedentary activity. Three to six was moderate. Anything over six was considered vigorous activity. So I would put these on the drivers and monitor their metabolism every minute of the day for 91 days in a row. Uh, and as they went through my program uh, and we started crunching the numbers and analyzing the data, what we saw was – um, everyone that completed the program, um, the average weight loss was 7% of their body weight, which is significant because the medical community says if you lose 7% of your body weight, you will reduce your risk for metabolic syndrome, which is a cluster of 60 medical disorders and 12 cancers. Wow. So when we looked at all the numbers and all the data, you know, we looked at, well, how did their calories change? And we found out that the cal the average calorie change was only 70 calories. Really? So, yeah. So by the end of the program, the, the calories had only changed by 70. And I'm thinking, oh, God, like everybody else, the reason why these drivers are overweight and, uh, and, and obese is because they they eat too much, right, and, and they sit all day and they're lazy. Well, it's, it's that chicken fried steak at the truck stop, right? No, it's not. And so that's what we started to learn because meanwhile, while I'm – monitoring their metabolism they're logging their food everything they eat and drink for 91 days uh -huh. so i have the most extensive biometric data on real-time truck driver physiology and i have the most extensive you know food and nutrition data um and i was able to combine this and we were analyzing all this and we found not only did the calories only change by about 70 calories which is like what half a cookie oh yeah yeah they actually moved less these drivers, they were averaging 19 pounds of weight loss in 13 weeks or 7% of their body weight. Their calories weren't changing that much. They were moving less. Really? Um, they went from an average of 103 minutes of activity to 88 minutes of activity. And so as a classically per, trained per personal – No, that, uh, um, per day. So 103 minutes of moderate activity. So that's less than an hour and a half. Oh, that's any kind of activity. So walking around, checking the truck and – yeah. yeah, anything that registered over three METs on this device. So, gotcha. yeah, that could be, you know, walking around, dialing down the landing gear, opening the trailer doors, um, you know, and for some drivers walking at a pretty good clip. Well, um, if, that, if that's part of their normal job, why was their activity decreasing? So <clears throat> what happened was in my program, one of the things that I started studying before I designed the program was metabolic endocrinology. Um, and I started reading in, you know, journal of physiology and all these things about uh, Tabata protocols and high, the benefits of high intensity exercise and how um, you can induce mitochondrial biogenesis, which means basically the mitochondria in your muscle cells is where you have the capacity to burn fat and produce energy. Mm -hmm. So the more mitochondria you have, you know, the more energy producing capacity you have. I started reading and studying all of these things and I realized and with the with the data that I was getting from the equipment, I realized the problem with truck drivers was not that they were overeating too many calories. In fact, they were under eating. They weren't getting their serum leptin levels had changed so much that they weren't getting the signal that they're hungry. So they're 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 skipping meals. No kidding. They're not giving their metabolism work to do, and so they go they drive all day sedentary with their body in starvation mode. Mm -hmm. Now. When they finally do eat, they, they overeat at that one or two particular meal, but their nutrition for the for the entire day or for the entire week, they're actually under eating. They're undernourished. Wow. So I realized that the problem, you know, we've all heard calories in, calories out. You want to lose weight, it's calories in, calories mm -hmm. out. You got to move more and eat less, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not what my data showed. My data showed that they weren't moving more. They were actually moving less but they were moving with more intensity. In fact, the one thing that all the drivers, the, all the drivers that lost weight had three things in common. You had to reduce your carbohydrates by a minimum of 10%. You had to, 
you had to increase your protein consumption by 5%. And this was the key. You had to get at least four minutes of high intense or vigorous activity. That ah. was the key. And that was the missing element because the drivers, we measured this. They, they were, what are drivers doing when they're not driving? They're still sitting. They're still resting in the sleeper. They're sitting down in the truck stop. Mm -hmm. We found out that the average driver is sedentary 23 hours and 20 minutes every single day. Holy moly. They sit more than anybody on the planet. And the problem was not the calories. In fact, this blew my mind, Glenn. They were actually burning more calories than they were consuming. They already had a calorie deficit. And by the classical theories, they shouldn't even be in my program. Right. So the problem wasn't calories. It was the low metabolism. And I had to design a program that was designed to turn their metabolism on before they start driving so that it could be burning fat at an accelerated rate and then keep it on while they were driving. And that's where the right. four minute came from. Um, realized that, you know, to, to start a new routine and to be consistent, it has to be convenient. Mm hmm. It has to fit into your schedule. So I, it's like, how could we fit in exercise into a truck driver's schedule? And then what I realized when I tested it out of myself was the only thing I could reasonably commit to was I literally had to be able to stop the truck, open the door, exercise for 15 minutes or less right on the side of my truck without changing clothes, without equipment, mm -hmm. and then get back in the truck and drive. So it had to be that simple and that easy. And within that 15 minutes of exercise – I had to get at least four minutes of high intensity. Okay. And if I didn't have 15 minutes, Glenn, then I just did four minutes all out. So this so this brings me back to my question I, I wanted to ask earlier. Why four? Why not three, five, seven? Because that's what the data showed. That four minutes is adequate? Because I, I know in it, your book you mentioned the, uh, the ROM machine, that $15,000 machine that looks kind yeah. of like the time traveler from H.G. Wells. Um, and you get your arms and your legs moving at one time, and it's supposed to be a, an all-out effort, as high intensity as you can stand. Now, my problem with that is if I uh, come in from driving home from work and I jump on this machine and go all out, that's really a recipe for injury and uh, shock and awe to the body. It's it, You really do need to warm up. You can't go from zero to 60 in zero seconds. Yeah, 30 seconds warm up. Yeah, so so that that machine, though it may be great, it does require a little bit more than that. And so I believe in your book, you you do recommend some walking or some calisthenics to get the body warmed up, correct? I mean, if you've got the time for it, absolutely. Um, but here, I mean, the round machine works on the same principles. And the whole idea is this. You've got to create a maximum demand for energy in order to trigger your system to what? Supply that demand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the body, you know this, you're a personal trainer. The body is going to first go through the glucose stores available in the muscles, right? Um, and, you know, you have about a 60-second supply of available glucose. Once that's done, your body has to go to another mechanism to get energy, and it's going to start pulling from your fat. So, the, again, another reason why four minutes is, one, you got to outlast the glucose supply, and two, you have to engage the fat-burning system long enough that it's actually kind of like on, that the, the oven is burning, so to speak. Right. And it see, the data showed, and this is consistent with what Tabata found out and developed the Tabata protocols or what ROM machine was based on or you know all this high-intensity interval training stuff that is now. I mean there's 30 years of research on this. Um, that's my book just showed that for truck drivers, you can do it with no equipment right on the side of your truck. Um, and that was what I call the minimum effective dosage. Yeah. Well, I think that's great. I, I, I love that more people are promoting this because I've been promoting that sort of thing for years. And, and there's been people that I know that will go to the gym and spend 30 to 60 minutes on the elliptical at a really moderate rate where they're either sweating or not sweating but they but if they think they're if they're sweating they think that they're burning a lot of calories and and I know that you talk about sweat in, in your book too so I'll, I'll have you get into that in a second but there are just some people that will absolutely not believe that you can have get better benefits 
uh, phys- physiological change with less time. You just have to put in a little more effort, right? You, you, you crunch all that energy you put into an hour and crunch it into four minutes, and there you go. And you are pushing the limits because what a lot of people don't realize is if you don't stress the body, if you don't stress the muscles and the mitochondria and push it beyond what it's comfortable, it's not going to get any better. It has no reason to. This is how we tell our muscles to get stronger, by lifting something we're not able to lift. Well, Glenn, I mean, there were people that didn't believe that the earth revolved around the sun. <laughs> That's true. And there are people that can't explain gravity, but it doesn't negate the fact that planes actually get off the ground. Right, right. So it's going to take people like us to to keep yes. standing on our soapbox and, and it's shouting a, out. It's a revolution in the fitness training world. It is. I, I mean, I see it in... Like I'm, you know, I, I was a world class swimmer back in college, and I still compete in master swimming now. And right now, in the world of swimming, there's this whole thing about ultra short race pace training, mm-hmm. which is you no longer swim six thousand, eight thousand yards. You no longer, you know, um, swim these long, slow, four hundred, five hundred, six hundred sets. It's one lap as fast as you can go over and over again. And it's disrupting the swimming world because some people are using it and doing very well. And it goes entirely against all the swim training that's been done in the last 30 to 40 years. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we are revolutionaries in a sense because more we people think more is better. That whole mentality you described about the people getting on the elliptical came with the idea that it's calories in, calories out. If you want to lose weight. Right, you got to burn more calories than you consume. Mm -hmm. So there are two things you can do: you can restrict calories, consume less, and you can move more. So all of a sudden, in what the 60s or 70s, we had we started seeing jogging and running, and people started running for 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 minutes, and then we had aerobics, and then we had you know marathon running, and then you know at the YMCA the class is now a 60 minute class or a 90 minute class or whatever, and it just kept getting longer and longer because people were thinking, well the more calories I burn, the more weight I'm going to lose. But research shows that after I think it's like 40 or 60 minutes, right, um, you start to stimulate the production of serum ghrelin, which is the appetite hormone. Yeah. So you may burn an additional two or three hundred calories, but you're going to eat an additional two or three hundred calories as well. But they were missing the boat. And the truck drivers were the perfect group of people to draw this out, which was they were their meta- they were sedentary all day. They never did anything that caused their metabolism to burn fat at an accelerated rate. So their metabolic set point was so low, Glenn, Mm -hmm. that that was the primary problem. It didn't matter if they calorie restricted. They still have this low metabolic set point. So I had to design something to turn that – to change that, and that's what the four-minute does. It literally turns your metabolism on so it's burning fat at an accelerated rate. That's the key. You could could walk a million steps and never have an effect on your metabolism. Right. You have to have that demand, and that's what I was saying about lifting a weight. The reason people lift weight is they have to lift a weight that's more comf- that's not comfortable. It's heavier than they're used to lifting. Otherwise, the body's not going to change. That's what forces the change. You yes. have to demand it, and we can't just yell at our muscles and say get stronger or speed up your <laughs> metabolism. We have to do it in a way that it that it understands, and that's by doing these things. And you know, and and speaking of the effectiveness, you brought up swimming, how people are doing essentially sprints instead of uh, LSD, long slow distance. Um, mm-hmm. I I discovered that quite by accident many years ago when I was training for ultra distance cycling races. You know, we're talking 24 hours, 500 miles, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I found that hit training, sprinting, in other words, little bouts of sprinting and some you know recovery at a normal uh, cruising pace, improved not only my speed but my endurance more than simply endurance riding did, way more. There you go. So I, I discovered this long before I even read the research, and then Tabata yeah. and Hit starts becoming more popular, and I, I can definitely see why, especially for busy people or people that, even if you don't like exercise, they could spend four minutes, right? That's not that hard. Well, they can, but I, I look, I look at it this way. 
let's say you're overweight or you're obese or you need, you need to lose weight, Glenn. That say that's your purpose. I need to lose weight. Yeah. Okay. When you start your day, you have a choice. Do you want to start your day with your metabolism on low or with it on high? Hmm. If your goal is you want to lose weight and you want to be burning fat while you're sitting at your desk or you're going through your day, you want your metabolism on high. That's right. So the question is, is how do you turn it on? And I have found that the most effective, least time consuming way to do that is to move with maximum intensity for four minutes. Doesn't matter what the movement is. Everybody's at a different level of fitness and conditioning. Everybody has different, you know, body composition and what they're capable of doing. It doesn't matter what the movement is. It so long as you're moving with maximum intensity, you're creating the, the demand, and you will know you're doing it right if you get to the point you're breathing so hard that you can barely finish a sentence. Yeah. Or if you're using a heart rate monitor watch, for most people, I mean, the, the heart rate is a secondary indirect measure of metabolic output. It's not my favorite, but without that device I was telling you about, I, there's no way to directly measure it anymore. Right. Um, but if minimum, you got to get your heart rate minimum, at least 80% of your max heart rate. And for a lot of people, we're talking 85, 90% to get the best results. Now but it's, this, it's four minutes. Now this brings up another point. That is very uncomfortable to do, and a lot of people just don't like bringing up their intensity that high. And in fact, I've I've done lots of fitness testing with people, and some people will be at let's say a a casual stroll and insist they're at a ten on the relative. Uh, perceived exertion scale from a zero to 10, 10 being you're being chased by a mama a grizzly bear who's really mad at you. And they would say they're at a 10 when they're, they're walking at a, you know, maybe a brisk pace, but so, so it, it certainly is relative, but they, they have to not be afraid to push themselves is what I would recommend. Do you have a different way of putting it? Well, Glenn, every single day we do a number of things we don't like to do. We don't want to do, and we're not motivated to do. But mm -hmm. we do it anyway, Exactly. particularly when it comes to our job, right? Mm -hmm. So why is it every day we have this faculty to override how we feel in order to perform and we'll use it for our job, but we won't use it when it comes to our health, I know. which is arguably more important, not arguably, I mean, it's more important than your job. It's actually a prerequisite, especially in truck driving, for example, you can't drive unless you get a DOT certification, which means you got to pass a physical. Yeah. But you're not working if you're sick in a hospital. You have more lost time and days away from work if you're obese and you're, 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 you're at risk for more illnesses and stuff like that. So, And all the studies show, right, you spend more and you earn less, mm -hmm. right, the bigger yep. you are. Yep. So, um, so I tell the drivers – you got to get to the point where you realize you can't afford not to do your four minutes because if you don't, being in the most unhealthy occupation in America with the highest rate of obesity, the highest rate of metabolic syndrome, the lowest life expectancy, average life expectancy of a long-haul truck driver is 61 to 64 years of age, mm -hmm. which means they are dying 10 to 15 years earlier than the average North American male. So you want to be in this industry and you do nothing – yeah, you are going to suffer one of those. It's only a matter of time. You can't afford not to do this. Just like there are things for your job you can't afford not to do if you want to get that paycheck. So you got to take motivation out of it. It's yeah. not, you know, what's that um, scriptural saying? You know, when I was a child, I did childish things. And when I became a man, you know, I had to put away those childish things. Yeah. There's a lot of things we have to do to be responsible to ourselves, to our kids, to our communities to our employers, right, that we don't like doing, but I'm sorry, that's called responsibility. It's called adulthood. Yes. And, you know, I want to I bring up another point. People use that argument that, oh, I don't want to exercise at a high intensity, however they, they phrase it, right? I'm using it like an mm -hmm. exercise physiologist because it, it hurts. It's painful. It's uncomfortable. It's unpleasant. But it seems to me that every time I've had a cold, it's been pretty painful and uncomfortable and unpleasant. And I can't imagine having a long-term illness, sickness, diabetes, all those things are not just uncomfortable and unpleasant, but a pain in the butt and expensive. Well, I mean, you are hitting on a very important aspect, Glenn, which is 
this is really more about behavior change. Mm-hmm. It has less to do with – I mean this – the actual losing weight is easy. You can join any number of programs, and if you just follow the program, you're going to lose weight. The problem people have is following the program, doing the thing they don't want to do or that they don't feel comfortable doing. That's, and that's where you get into behavior change, and behavior change is much more challenging. Right. Um, so when I'm dealing with behavior change, you know, information alone, alone is not enough to get someone – to, to, to take action, to take initiative. You've got to connect the information with energy. With, and their, that, with their lifestyle and, and, you know, also there's another way of looking at it. They need well, to be able it, to see the benefits versus the, the downside. No, it's not even seeing the benefits and the downsides because I talk about that all the time. I still get people, they, they, don't, they don't take action. What I have found works, and one of the reasons why my program is the number one weight loss program in the country and people that I work with directly is you got to connect the information with, again, what I call energy. And what I mean by that is a person's emotions and values. Because if you look at the word emotion, the root word of emotion is motion. It comes from the Latin movere. It means to move. literally means energy. And if I, I can connect the information, as you say, the benefits – or the, the negative outcomes, if I can connect that with real emotions that you have based on what's going on in your life, that's where you're going to find the energy to do the thing that you don't want to do. So I ask drivers that enroll in my program all the time when they go through orientation. I was like, what was it that motivated you to finally enroll? And if you look at that word again, motivation, it's the same word as emotion, same mm-hmm. root word. Yep. Okay. Um, and so when you um, when you ask them that, they start talking about the things that are most important to them. They start talking about you know my kids or my grandkids, uh, and they want to be around for them. Uh, and we're talking about people who are 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 pounds overweight. These are people that they come to me because they're scared. They want to be around for their kids and their grandkids, or they've just lost a friend or a family member to cardiovascular disease. And deep down inside, they know how they're, that they're in denial and how bad they are. And they finally come to terms with it. Or I get people that are enrolling because, um, they're experienced, they're having experiences like the woman who came to me because she was, uh, she went to an amusement park with her granddaughter and they kicked her off the roller coaster because they couldn't get the lap belt across. Oh, and she wow. felt humiliated and embarrassed. Right. Or I, I had a couple came to me. They drove teams. And they said, Sipiwe, we went on a cruise and we couldn't do any of the activities. They had a weight restriction on horseback riding. They had a weight restriction on zip lining. And we realized we were missing out on life because we were too big. We were too unfit. Yeah. So – the drivers that actually enroll in my program, they're coachable. They just want to know what's going to be effective. And I say, hey, you got a choice. You can spend 60 minutes in a gym doing moderate activity and get very limited results, and you got to take an hour. Or you can just go four minutes all out. Yeah, it's going to be uncomfortable, but it's only four minutes. But it's going to be highly effective. You get it done, and then you go about your day. And they do it. Wow. Wow. And what's great about that is they don't need to join a gym and they don't need a bunch of expensive equipment, maybe some stretch bands, right? They don't even need stretch bands. I show them just body weight exercises because especially for their lifestyle and this and, and what I say all the time is if it will work for truckers with all the restrictions they have, it'll work for anybody in America. Absolutely. It has to be convenient. If you have to even think about setting up equipment or using equipment or learning how to use new equipment, that just adds a layer of complexity. If you got to change clothes, if you have to go somewhere to do it. So I had to figure out how can I eliminate all the barriers? So it's something you can do anytime, any place, anywhere. You don't need to, because it's only four minutes. You don't need to change clothes. So if you're a businessman, and I tell the executives that I work with all the time, I'm like, you brush your teeth in the morning, right? And, and <laughs> Most of them say, yeah, and I'm like, you take a shower, don't you? And I'm like, yeah. So use that as your trigger. You're brushing your teeth. Why? Because you love the feel of the bristles on your teeth? You love how the toothpaste tastes in your mouth? No, you don't get off because you enjoy brushing your teeth. You're doing it because what? You can't afford not to. You're going to have a messed up grill and bad breath, and you're going to have social problems 
if you don't brush your teeth, right? How long does it take you to brush your teeth? I don't know, 30 seconds, a minute, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so after you do that minute, can't you just then do four minutes, right? You can do it right in your bathroom. Mm -hmm. You can do it in your bedroom, four minutes, any movement you can do, maximum intensity, and then go take your shower and go about your day knowing you've turned your metabolism on and you are burning fat at an accelerated rate. That's half the battle right there. Yeah. The only thing you have to do after that is keep the metabolism going by eating every three hours and eating the right thing every three hours. And what's great about your book is you have a bunch of uh, exercises, for examples, with people out there in parking lots doing doing certain things, you know, burpees and push-ups and squats and step-ups and things like that. Hotel um, rooms, laundry mats, right? In your yeah. driveway, anywhere, at your desk, anywhere. Because you don't need any equipment. And you got to remember, your goal is not to burn calories during the your workout the goal is simply how high can i spike my metabolism you know how high can i turn my radio on right i'm outside you know i, I want to hear the radio if i turn it on to two and i'm outside working and got my lawnmower going, i can't hear it but if i turn it on to 10 i might be able to hear it so it's right. the same thing how do i turn my metabolism on to 10 that's the goal and you can do it in four minutes and if you do that you're done yep that's that's pretty awesome. So, Sapiwe, where can people find your book? Ah, great. Um, you can go to four minute fit book dot com forward slash live fit. Awesome. Uh, so this is the landing page for your podcast. We want your listeners to be able to um, find me and find the book easy. Again, that's four minute fit book dot com forward slash live fit and four is the number four okay that's what i was going to ask you that's fantastic yep. so i will of course have a link to that on the show notes page at livefitpodcast.com i'll also have some other contact information for you if anybody wants to contact you directly i believe i have that yes and uh thank you sapiwe it's been a pleasure speaking with you i'm glad there's somebody else on the same wavelength really promoting this stuff and and working on primarily a niche an audience that has needed it for years and really needed a guy like you i, I so it, i i thank you just for from the fitness industry but i'm sure you get plenty of thanks from them as well hey thanks glenn you know i'm i feel like i'm i'm doing the thing i need to do and i'm helping the people that need the most help are getting it so uh, i just feel really grateful that i'm having this opportunity and we're really helping people improve their life that's awesome. So even if you're not a trucker, buy this book. It, it really can help you out. Absolutely. All right, Sapiwe, you have a great day. You too, Glenn. All right. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Live Fit Podcast. Please subscribe and share with someone you care about. Read show notes, articles, resources, and learn more about our weight management programs at livefitpodcast.com. Once again, thanks for listening and always remember to...